You're listening to episode 686 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. This week's episode is entitled, Lent is Good, given on the first Sunday in Lent, 2019. I've heard a critique by non-Catholic Christians that it's really weird that we have a season like Lent. This is usually for the non-liturgical uh, communities. Because Lutherans and Episcopalians, Anglicans, uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, they do recognize Lent as a season. But if you go to your, like, your evangelical churches, they don't generally do that. Where prayer, fasting, and almsgiving is our signature themes, these same people claim that we shouldn't need a season to do this, that we should be like this all the time. And you know what? There are some valid reasons there. There is some truth to these words. We should be living our lives of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We should be people of strong faith and action all the time. Their critique in one sense is true. But the world around us and our own fallen nature doesn't seem to work that way, at least not this side of heaven. Anthropologists, biologists, dietitians, doctors, psychologists, physicians, and especially marketing experts, they know that nature has its seasons, and each season has its purpose. Similarly, we know that humans are creatures of seasons, as well as habits. We also know by our own experience that we do not always do what we should do all the time. We know that we need programs like diets and routines, retreats, times of enhanced engagement, and the like, in order to open up and to change so that God's grace can be upon us. God wants to pour grace on us, but we're often, too often, closed. Why? Very simply, we are fallen. We are sinners. See, if we were not, then we wouldn't need all these wonderful programs like AA or a relationship recovery group or Rachel's Vineyards or drug addiction counseling. We wouldn't have any of these problems. We wouldn't need these wonderful gifts that are trying to heal us and help us. But we do. And that's the example that we need to demonstrate that we're fallen. We simply don't do what we should do all the time. And that's why we're here. We come to Mass because we are fallen. We don't come to Mass because we're perfect. We come to Mass because we are broken. We have failed. We have been tempted and found wanting. I include myself. Yet, this is important. We are never without God's grace. For we can, with him, start over again. We can repent and return to him. God wants to forgive us. The facts are that we need to have periods of time to concentrate on specific things in order to create new habits that will improve our lives. The same goes for our spiritual lives. You know, Weight Watchers has been around for a long time for a good reason, because it's effective. The church has been around for 2,000 years because she's effective, too. While Jesus didn't fall or sin, he was a person of seasons and habits as well. It's interesting. He was faithful to the Sabbath every week. He went to the temple each year for Passover and many other wonderful tr Jewish traditions. He didn't eschew them, even though... Think of who he is. Did he need any of these things? I mean, he's God, right? What does he need? Nothing. He needs nothing. But he did it. He's also human. And he's showing us the way. Knowing how he's created us, he honors his creation by following how creation will, you could say, roll. That's how we roll, right? It's interesting. He was tempted as we were. We hear 
that in the Gospel of Luke, he was tempted by the devil, and the devil didn't leave him until he finished every temptation. Did you catch that? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, but did not give in, did not sin. You know what one of those um, habits that he was involved in was prayer. Because he prayed, he was very much in touch with his father. So Lent is not a gimmick. It's actually an honest and truly holy season, a period of preparation for the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. The act of living through a season is a simple recognition of how human nature works. We are weak. Yeah, okay, so we're weak. At least we're honest that we need these periods of time, preparation times, to really focus on things. And I'm starting to wonder, there may be a few people out there that don't need it and they really are holy most of their time, but I'm, I'm suspicious in a way. I'm thinking maybe actually that's a cop-out because possibly the people say, we don't need those seasons, now have an excuse never to actually do anything about it, right? I'm overweight, so I don't need to go to Weight Watchers. I'm gonna, I'll figure it out on my own. And it doesn't work. And only when they get some help does it work. AA is the same way. I'm okay, I'm okay with my drinking. Uh, NA, I'm okay with my drug addiction. I've got it under control. That's called insanity. Doing the same thing and expecting different results is insanity. We need help. I need help. Guess where I'm going after this today? I'm going on a retreat. I'm going on a silent retreat. I've been uh, here in Southern Oregon for nine years as the pastor of St. Anne and St. Patrick's and Our Lady of the River. And I used to go on a silent retreat every year. I know it sounds weird. The extrovert, me, going on a silent retreat. Oh, yeah, that's the medicine I need. It gets me grounded and lets me go. I, and I remember, like, St. Therese, you know, of Calcutta, Teresa of Calcutta. You know, she had a, a very deep experience with Jesus, and it was amazing. And it was early on in her, her religious life. It was so potent that in the, the years that followed, she did not have any kind of spiritual, you know, uh, strong sense of his presence. He was silent to her. But that one experience was so potent, it, it drove her to ministry, as we all know, for 40 years. By the way, we never knew about this until she passed away and her spiritual director finally released her diary. You can read it. It was shocking to the world that Mother Teresa had no like, real connection with Jesus. Well, she obviously did because she was in the Eucharist all the time in adoration and had Mass every day and went to confession often. But I'm talking about that, that, sen that sensual one where we hear him or we feel him. She had no sense of that. She was driven by the knowledge of the truth. Her faith compelled her because she knew she was doing what she was called to do. For me, I'm not Mother Teresa, not even, long, not even close. For me, going on a retreat, a silent retreat particularly, is one of those grounding things. I realized I needed to go on a retreat. I do go on a retreat every year, but I have stopped going to the silent retreat that I used to go on. It was a Jesuit-led retreat. Maybe that's... Uh, Maybe that was what I really needed. I'm a closet Jesuit, everybody. Coming out of the closet, I'm a Jesuit. No, I'm Dawson. But you know what? That silent retreat moved aside all kinds of distractions. So looking closely at these three temptations leveled against Jesus, we see this first, that the Spirit led him into the desert and to be tempted. Did you catch that? That sounds strange. Like, what? You mean... That God led Jesus, the Spirit led Jesus into temptation? Yeah, he was tempted, but did he give in? No, he did not. See, temptation is not necessarily a bad thing. It's when we give in to it. In fact, when we are tempted and we say no to the temptation, we are now resolved in our, our abilities. Now we know we have actually a particular gift to say no. We have said no to something that's bad for us. And it creates a really good boundary for us. We know, yep, I can say no to that. In fact, it makes us stronger. 
any of you have any, have any kind of weight training or uh, training for athletics, you push yourself, you stretch your muscles to the point of almost aching, and guess what happens? You know your limit, because you don't hurt yourself, but then by pushing yourself like that, you get stronger. In this case, it's saying no to temptation. Temptation itself is not a sin, it's the giving in to that temptation that's a sin. <clears throat> Some people come to confession and they'll say things like, uh, well, I was tempted to do this. I go, well, did you do it? Well, no. Well, good for you, that's awesome, right? That's, that's a good thing. I pray for our teens, when especially they graduate from high school, because there's so many now new things that are gonna come to them that they may be tempted to step out and do something that's very dangerous for them. They know the truth, and yet now I have mom and dad not around, and I'm gonna maybe do what I shouldn't do. They're tempted. And I pray that they will not give in to temptation, and if they do, that it won't destroy them. You know, uh, just a word for advice, as parents probably know this, but our younger people, uh, as you get older, especially as a teen, uh, you find out that, you know, sometimes mom and dad are wrong, but just trust when you get into your 25s and 20, you know, 30s, maybe more, you find out, you know, actually, some of the things they said were right on. And, and uh, on occasion, you might even say, wait, I hear mom talking right now as you're saying something to our kids as we were parents, right? That's what I was told. So being tempted helps us find our boundaries and gives us strength. By going into the desert, as Jesus did, he then became not distracted. He was, everything was pushed away. And I, really, I personally relate to that because going on a retreat this week, for me, is going to push away things that, and I get distracted by and be focused about one thing. Number one, being quiet. Number two, listening. How much of our prayer is talking to God. You know, I talk a lot to God. I just started, I said, let us pray, and I said something, didn't I? So I get the privilege now of being quiet for a week, or part of a week, and just listening. So going on a retreat has similar ideas of a desert experience. The Trappist Abbey is not a desert, but it's, there's not much going on there. Let's just say, um, the Benedictines are pretty serious Catholic Christians. You know, they live as in a monastic community, and the Trappists are a reformed version of Benedictinism. So that's like, you want to be a serious Benedictine? Be a Trappist. You know, when they die, they just dig a hole and throw you in it and bury you. Yeah. Sometimes people want a, a, a casket or a Trappist casket. They're just wood box. That's all it is. Nothing special. They're serious people. So going on a retreat has great effects on us. I know it does for me. And let's go of those things. Think about the things that you have in your world that you've been spending a lot of time on that are distractions. Maybe you're spending too much time on those things. Maybe you happen to be preparing for summer, possibly, and there's an activity like, oh, I don't know, astronomy. I don't know, just throw it out there. And you've set up your telescope in your living room, moved all the furniture around, and you've been, you've been hyper-focusing on the software and how to image things, and right? I'm sure that's what you've been doing, right? And inordinate amounts of time, you're finding like, whoa, it's getting late at night. I got to get up and do mass. Oh, ooh, did I just say that? Okay, it's me. Yeah, that's me. There's a big telescope in my living room right now. And I packed, you know, un 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 unhooked it all and put it nice and neat. And I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm going to leave for that time. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to forget about that telescope. And I'm going to come back. I'll bet you. Like, oh, there's a telescope. And that's nice. As opposed to, precious, my precious telescope, right? <laughs> it doesn't, it's not a very, you know, it's not a high-end telescope anyway. So it's, but, but it's a thing that I've, you know, I got fixated on for the last week or so. What are you fixated on? What do you need to push aside? Have you ever gone like on a vacation and you were very excited about something that was at home and you left for a vacation and you come back to it and you go, oh yeah, that thing. You know, and I praise God in those moments come like, Ah, I'm no longer enslaved to that thing. And now I can actually appreciate it for what it is. It's not God. Even though I can look through my telescope and look, look into the heavens. Right? So Lent is a time to help us focus and to unfocus other things that we shouldn't be focused on. So here's the temptations. Keep in mind, there's three temptations that are mentioned, but all the three are kind of wrapped up, wrap up a whole bunch of stuff. 
So here's some thoughts. The first temptation is about the focusing or the not focusing on God, but on the good of our body or the things our body wants. The temptation of like food, and drink, sex maybe, or, or other sensual things. And all these things are desire of the body and they're not necessarily bad. In fact, they're good. But none of these are the ultimate good. And when we reverse them and they make it, that is our goal. Then we, we get everything all goofed up. Thomas Merton, in fact, I was reading a, or listening to a podcast by Bishop Robert Barron. And he quoted Thomas Merton as saying that this temptation to our sensualness, that is to let the sensualness dominate us and determine everything that's going on, is like being a child. When our senses want something, or when a child wants something like to be fed, they will be persistent. They will constantly talk at you. Come on, mom, can I, can I now? Can I, mom, come on, let's go, let's do it. They will not let you down. You might turn your head, but they will not forget, and they will want what they want when they want it, and they will not let you forget it. Parents know this. They, I think every child, I know I was like that, you know, Yanking at mom, 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 mom. I'm like the ninth of nine kids, so I had to do that a lot, right? Because there's a lot of other distractions going on in the house. But we also know, and parents know this very well, that if, if a parent gives in to every desire of the child, guess who will be ruling the house? The child. And chaos will occur, like a bomb will drop. And what we'll create is a monster out of a child. So similarly, then, if we indulge in every sensual desire and let it dominate us, our, it'll totally distract us from what is going on really. Like we will let God go on aside. We will not allow ourselves to get to know God deeper because we're too engrossed in ourself. Jesus' response is this way. He says, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word of God. And it's not that we don't need bread. But we need God before bread. He stands up to the devil in this case. And he clarifies what is the center of our joy. Sensual pleasure, while good, will dominate and distract us about the truth of ourselves and of our life and what God has meant us to do. So we will then simply then be skimming along in life we will be walking on a thin facade and never grasp the deep meaning of some things. It just reminds me of Hollywood. Hollywood is dominated by this very thing and how sad it is. How shallow our lives will be and how destructive that can be for a marriage or anybody attempting to think about religious life. We will be shackled like we're in chains by the sensual desires because we let them dominate us. And by, my friends, this is what fasting does for us. It takes over. Fasting allows us to remind us that we can have power over these desires. We don't have to listen to them or obey them all the time. By the way, if you're hungry, maybe you should eat, right? But you know what? There's actually been scientific proof that if you know, subtract out any kind of diabetes or physical illnesses, that it is healthy to periodically fast. Spiritually, we know this because it's this idea of not letting ourselves being overcome by our spiritual sense or our, our, our uh, sensual desires uh, because then we'll be enslaved by them. Fasting helps us with that. And then when we know that we've successfully fasted, we can actually rejoice and give glory to God because, yes, God has given me the power over these things. We're called ultimately to be in control of ourselves. Have you met somebody who's out of control? Boy, is that a mess, All right? They completely have been taken over by their sensual desires. Second temptation that happened involves power. Again, power in itself is not a bad thing, but power in the worldly sense is not the ultimate good. Because remember, who is? God. God is the ultimate power. And Jesus is God. This is the interesting thing. Jesus, who is God, is being tempted by the devil to have power. By the way, there's a lot of humor in here, by the way. Not, not like, ha, knee slap. Oh, that's hilarious. But think about it. The devil claims that he has the power over the world. And he's saying this to whom? Now, it would make sense if he said it to us. 
be like, yeah, I see, I see you working in the world. But now he says it to, he says it to Jesus. He was like, um, like, who made you? I mean, I can imagine Jesus saying this to him, but you don't hear anything. Now, who is it that made you, Satan? You, the fallen angel? Who made the angels? I did with the Father and the Holy Spirit. How ironic that the, that the devil is telling him how the order of things go. How it is that the devil is looking at the one who is all-powerful and claiming to give him a bargain. How dumb of the devil. <laughs> Crazy. But look at, look at the world. Look at how many people who have been given power and have taken that power to abuse others. I mean, the sex scandal that has occurred in our church and elsewhere in our country, the Me Too movement is a great awakening. By the way, this is not about sex, though. Those are about power and control. Sex is a mean to gain power, control over someone. The power is meant to be given away and given for the good of others, not oneself. And when it is for oneself, we call those people dictators. And if we stand against them, now we will know the full force of the devil. C.S. Lewis mentioned something like this. It's not, it's not so powerful to let the German army mow over you. What's really a, power, a hard thing to do and needs power is to resist that, that Nazi Germany. How many people did that? That's amazing. Strangely, the devil makes a claim about being the ruler of the world, and he's saying this to God, who is the creator of all of it, the creator of power, the creator of all things. Jesus' response to the devil is to remind him who the ultimate power is, and it isn't the devil. How many people have sold their souls in an illusion of power that has been given to them by making and colluding with evil? They're the devil. The third temptation is for glory, the feeding of the ego, the temptation of reputation. Note this, what's happened is Jesus was first talking to the devil, kind of on a low place, then in a higher place, and now at the top of the temple, the parapet of the temple. You keep in mind, the, the temple itself for Jews, Jesus is a Jew, the temple is the place, the center of everything for Jews. This is where God dwells, and all the, all the places, I mean, Jesus went to the temple every year for the Passover. God lives there. In fact, even still today, what's remaining of the temple, the Western Wall, Jews still come and flock there because God is there. This is where God dwells. So, God is all glory. And it's interesting, once again, kind of humorous, that Satan or the devil is trying to tempt Jesus to glory. He's kind of like, you know, before you came into being, I was a glory. I have actually hidden my glory from you and became man. Before nobody could see God and live, we hear in the Old Testament. But now, because he's hidden his glory and, his, and clothed in his humanity, he's now there. And how dumb the devil is that he thinks he's going to fool him. Like, aha, I got him now, right? This is that divine joke upon Satan, which gets fully concluded at the resurrection, right? Where Jesus goes to hell brings all those who are just with him. And Satan is kind of like sitting there like, what just happened? Because he thought he had him finally. And he doesn't have him anymore. It's like he slipped right through his fingers because he was not just Jesus the human, he was also Jesus God. But see, we are going to be given sometimes glory. We're called to give glory to God, but think about like the Olympians, people that in athletic uh, competitions, they do amazing things. And we recognize those amazing things because they've done something amazing, astounding, something that we probably can't do. And we, we, we go, wow, look at that person. What a great thing they did. And the big question then becomes, what do they do with that? Are they humble? Because if they're not, this is not good. They're then, glory may be given to them, but then they hoard it, right? Think about, like, I think of football, when someone does something amazing, I'm looking to see what they do with it. Do they, do they kind of point up into heaven and say, thank you, God, praise you, Lord? Or when someone's given a compliment of some kind, what do we do with that? Like, thanks, and I'm right. Yes, keep bringing it to me, right? Or do they say, thank you, praise God? 
Because everything that they can do, all that they do is they get from God. The abilities that they had, they've nurtured so they could do this amazing thing. But if they didn't have the abilities, it doesn't matter how much they nurture it. They just can't do it. Some people, the Pope, by the way, have you ever noticed the Pope doesn't sing the Mass? We're told to chant the Mass. When he was elected, I was like, uh-oh, let's see what a Jesuit does. He doesn't sing at all. I happen to know, because a friend of mine was his MC, and the Pope can't sing because he's tone deaf. And I'm so glad that he doesn't sing. Have you ever been around somebody who's singing bad? You know, oh, say, can you see? And you're like, oh, turn them down, please. Get somebody else in here. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll have priests that will roll through the, our church, that a parochial vicar that can't sing. I might say, you know, just say the prayers. It's all good. But then to seek out glory for oneself is great arrogance, to say the least. It's a narcissism that destroys us. Nobody wants to be around these kind of people, but they're so narcissistic they can't see it. Maybe that's the devil's problem. He's the ultimate in a narcissist. And again, how ironic it is that he's attempting to, to tempt Jesus, who is glory and glorious. He doesn't need the devil to tell them that. He doesn't need to stand at the temple parapet to do that. He is by his being glorious. And you know what? We can share in some of that. Because we want Jesus wants us to be like him. So know this, that Jesus was tempted in every way. In every way that we're tempted. Because keep in mind, we might say, and I've heard this, well, I'm sure God doesn't really, I'm not sure he can forgive me, or he doesn't understand this thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> He has been tempted in every way. Which could be scandals if you think about some of our sins. Like, uh, even that? Yeah, even that. But he didn't give in. He didn't sin. And that's what's great. He's actually sharing, telling us by his example that we can overcome those temptations if we yoke ourselves to him. Go to confession and, and experience this, this liberation. And experience Lent as a season because it's genius. The Jewish faith, the Catholic faith is genius. God has given us these faiths because they give us seasons so we can focus on things because we wouldn't normally. We can choose to move away from sin. We can choose to overcome these things by God's grace. We can choose to let, say no to the temptations. We can choose to pray fast and give alms. And what does that do for us? It draws us closer to Jesus. It draws us and makes us more human. It purifies us and makes us holy. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Father Bill's podcast. Well, I'd ask that you would pray for me as I do this silent retreat, as I mentioned in the podcast, and that I would be open to God's grace, who will center me, remind me of how much I'm loved, of course, and be able to be then more energized so I can uh, be launched at, back into ministry at the end of the week for the weekend to come. Now, as always, if you have any questions or comments, I invite you to go to my website, fatherbill.org, F-R-B-I-L-L.org, and there you can email me a question or a comment. Uh, again, I won't get to it this week because uh, I'll be on retreat, but I'll get back to it as soon as I can. You can also check out what's going on on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And until next time, may God bless you and have a great week. Bye-bye. <laughs>